Hello, everyone, and welcome to the garden of the Kelly Writers House. My name is Ali Katz. I'm the program coordinator here. Um, and this is actually our first real arts program of the semester. Uh, real arts is this great program where Anthony DeCurtis connects the Penn and Philadelphia community with people working in the arts. Um, we're so grateful to have him doing that here. Uh, thank you all also for braving our garden space. Um, Arts Cafe will be done soon. In the meantime, we do have uh, some mosquito repellent. So <laughs> if you need that, um, I'm gonna put some in the back. There's some up here too, if you wanna like stealthily come down. Um, we'll have a reception afterwards and I'm sure Nate will be very happy to sign books, which are for sale in the back. Uh, we have them for $15, uh, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful book. Um, we're also really, really excited to have Nate back because he's one of our founding students. Um, so let's welcome Nate and Anthony. Thank you, Allie. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, this is great. Uh, it's especially meaningful to me because uh, I was the assistant coordinator, the, the first assi assistant coordinator at the Kelly Writers House the last time it was under construction, um, which was when they were turning it from the plain old Writers House to the Kelly Writers House, circa 1997. Um, and uh, Carrie Sheridan and I worked in a, in a dorm room at High Rise East for the better part of a year um, as you know, contractors and builders were coming in and out of the space. So this is actually very familiar to me to, to see all the construction there. But I'm excited uh, for new things um, at KWH. Um, it's also really special to be here because Philadelphia is the place where I became a critic. Um, half by accident, maybe more than half. Um, I just came from Anthony's class and I was talking about this a bit. Um, but it was for the Philadelphia City Paper, RIP, uh, that I first began writing about music and, and really first began writing, uh, practicing journalism in any form. Um, and it was really valuable to me to, um, to have a, a creative community like the jazz scene in Philly that was rich and full of incredible artists, but also just small enough that you couldn't get away with anything. Um, you know, you had to be able to back up what you were saying at the bar. <laughs> so that was a really valuable uh, thing at the beginning stages of, of my career. Um, so I'm gonna read very briefly, and then uh, we'll have a conversation between us and then open it up to all of you. Um, I thought it would be appropriate to read a little bit from a chapter called Exposures, um, which is about it's largely about Esperanza Spalding. And I, I'm curious, has anybody been um, tuned into Esperanza this week? Um, so she is uh, in the process of rolling out her new album, um, one track every day uh, until all 12 tracks are out. She's calling it 12 Little Spells. And, um, and so, you know, at 1212 12, every day, a new song appears on Facebook Live and Instagram. And so it's this little experiment this, this rollout, you know, that she's saying, well, let's see how this works, you know, and the album in full will be out at the end of the process. And so that experimenting with distribution and kind of just trying to figure it out is, is also a part of what I write about in this chapter. Um, so I'll read the very beginning and the very end of this. By 11 a.m. Thursday, she was writing lyrics on the wall. Slanted blocks of text, all caps, some phrases already crossed out or circled. A wide scroll of butcher paper had been taped to the wall, and the felt tip of her black marker made soft, scratchy noises as she scribbled, hurriedly, as if taking notation from an unheard voice. This was Esperanza Spaulding, the irrepressible bassist, singer-songwriter, and composer-band leader, making her fifth album, Exposure, in a Los Angeles recording studio. The entire session was streaming live online in a multicam feed viewed by as many as a few thousand people at a time. While Spalding wrote her lyrics, a chyron at the bottom of the browser window read, 50 hours in. What this meant was that she hadn't left the studio compound in more than two full days and still had about a day to go. This, of course, was all by purposeful design. 
Few jazz musicians have ever been more comfortable in the spotlight than Spalding, and the creation of Exposure in mid-September of 2017 showed how deftly she bends that spotlight to her uses. The project, part marathon recording session, part performance art happening, part Truman Show style surveillance ploy, put her in the studio for an uninterrupted 77 hours, ostensibly without so much as a scrap of premeditated material. Spalding's only advanced preparation had been to schedule time with her bandmates, along with some featured guests, like the powerhouse vocalist Layla Hathaway, keyboardist Robert Glasper, and violinist and singer-songwriter Andrew Bird. They came and went while Spalding stayed put, musing or tinkering in those ample moments when she wasn't tracking parts. The unusual constraints of the project led her to approach things differently. She began the recording session not at her bass, laying the foundation of a song, but rather on the microphone, inventing top-line flourishes. She was seated on a green room couch, singing wordless hooks and phrases that she then fastidiously multi-tracked into the contours of a song, like a spider weaving filaments into a web. Spalding has the animated charisma of a precocious student in a gifted and talented program, which may well be the byproduct of lived experience. She was a frank, disarming, and weirdly magnetic presence throughout her studio residency, even in the long stretches that amounted to one or another form of drudgery. By 3 p.m. Pacific time on Wednesday, 30 hours in, she could be seen at a white lacquered upright piano in what resembled a utility closet, obsessively worrying two or three bars of a serpentine line. She seemed tired. Her hair was tied back, her posture slumped. She kept clearing her throat. That little tendril of melody, spiky with tritone dissonance, was ungainly. She hammered away at that irksome phrase for over an hour. Other moments during exposure fell closer to a conventional recording session. A visitor checking the stream around hour 39 would have caught Spalding laying instrumental tracks with Glasper, keyboardist Ray Angry, drummer Justin Tyson, and guitarist Matthew Stevens. They were playing the final take of one of her new inventions, a major key reverie in floating waltz time. She sang instructions, calling audibles as they played. This action was suitable for a highlight reel. One bootleg video lifted from the stream, seven and a half minutes in duration, quickly racked up more than 100,000 views on YouTube. The larger motivation behind exposure was twofold. On the one hand, it was an experiment in Spartan creative focus and a tribute to the almighty power of a deadline. There's no editing, Spalding declared in one of the video teasers for the project, posted to social media. There's no tweaking, fixing, planning, prepping. She seemed excited by this beat the buzzer aspect of her self-imposed challenge, convinced that the added pressure could only result in a finer result, a diamond crushed from a lump of coal. On the other hand, of course, exposure was a canny publicity stunt, a way into the public conversation at a time when one usually had to shout to be heard. A couple of days before the countdown clock began, she performed a spontaneous hour-long duet with the architect Frank Gehry. The session, streamed on Facebook courtesy of Architectural Digest, took place in a light-filled atrium of Gary's home studio in Los Angeles. While Spalding sang and played, he sketched at an easel. His charcoal line drawings, conveying a sort of loose, nudely panache, were later auctioned for charity along with a recording of her improvisations. So it was a gimmick, yes. But even a viewer predisposed towards cynicism would have had to admit that something audacious was afoot. Exposure was the rare peak behind the curtain that managed not to be demystifying because it rested on a bedrock faith that Spalding was in possession of all the tools, the wit, the stamina, the creative fortitude to come out looking sharp. It also employed a useful strategy familiar to teachers and magicians alike. Show your work. I think I'm going to stop there, actually, because I've, I've, I'd like to jump right in. Oh, okay, great. I mean, I love listening to it. I mean, one of the things I was talking to Nate about was, um, you know, this book is so filled with ideas and, uh, you know, is um, so ranging in its references. And when you're doing that, you know, the precision of your language is very important. And I was really struck by um, I was certainly the quality of thought, which was, uh, you know, I've, having read Nate's stuff for a long time, I and mean, it was not a surprise. But you know, sustaining that quality of writing, um, you know, over a book of this length is really quite a trick. And that, uh, you know, we just heard a nice, uh, a nice sample from it. Um, I wanted to ask about, you know, 
you totally, I mean, as we, another thing we were talking about earlier was, uh, you know, you kind of really went for it here. You know, you're making kind of big statements about, you know, well, jazz for the new century and this sense of kind of breaking down, you know, a lot of the kind of black and white ways that people have historically thought about jazz. And you've, you know, you've really inserted yourself into, um, you know, a major discussion. And I wanted to know, like, at what point, um, you know, you decided that that's what you wanted to do with this book. And, you know, like, how did that idea evolve? Because, you know, working at the Times for 12 years, as you, as you have, you know, working at The Voice, and you're writing, you know, however many pieces a week, you know, you can get caught up in that day-to-day -day and, you know, moment-to-moment -moment in this show and that record. But, like, to really get the kind of perspective and... Uh, kind of ease of um, kind of broad thought that's in here is, you know, is really something special. And I wonder, you know, how that evolved. Well, first of all, thank you so much for all the amazing, wonderful things you just said. <laughs> no, um, for sure. Uh, I mean, that was my introduction. <laughs> you just sort of jumped in here, so I, um, I thought I would. Uh, I thought I would get to some of those points. No, I, I, I greatly appreciate yeah. it. Um, I am. By nature, more of a um, of minutia worrier. Um, I'm I'm a I'm sort of a a critic who um, naturally gravitates toward and fixates on the the particular detail, um, and so it actually it it, re it requires a little bit of conscious effort to pull back and <clears throat> say how does this fit in? What is the larger narrative? Um, what how does this articulate a sort of new um, argument for the history, um, and so that was what that was sort of the the great uh, terrifying challenge, and also the, the you know the irreducible gift of the book, um, because I said, well, there, if I'm going to do this as a book, it needs to justify its existence with kind of some sort of um, like momentous claim, you know, and it's and it's not a, a a grand sort of unifying theory, but it is a kind of um, like situating like everything that's happening right now, which is so slippery and hard to define and, and hard to wrap your arms around in a certain way. But saying, well, well what does that tell us then about the state of the music? You know, um, we can we can struggle towards uh, comprehending it all, and we may never get there, but. First of all, it's it's worth trying, and then secondly, the the very sort of um, multiplicities and um, complexities of that landscape is in itself instructive, um, and so that was where I started. Was just saying, okay, how is this how is this moment different from what came before, and then how is it actually a continuation? Um, and I feel like both of those things are true. Well, another of the interesting things about the book, and I, I wanted to ask if, if you know, if this is just a kind of reflection of your, of you as a person, um, or you know, specifically you as a critic. But you know, so much, you know, I mean, historically, so much writing about jazz has been so polemical. You know, this is the real thing; that's not the real thing. You're just kind of stating very clearly where the lines are. Whereas one of the uh, you know one of the things you do very well is you kind of give everybody their due you know in that you know thinking about specifically there's a chapter called Uptown Downtown you know talking about jazz at Lincoln Center and jazz at Lincoln Center and Winton Marsalis and the whole kind of traditionalist sense of jazz that's being put forward there and then kind of looking at the knitting factory downtown and what's going on there and you know I'm not a jazz expert but I was living in New York through all that I'm a music fan you know, participated on both ends of those things, um, you know, knew all the fights, that, the jazz wars, the fights that were going on about it. Um, but I was struck by your ability to kind of look at the Uptown thing and understand uh, what the impulses of someone like Wynton Marsalis were and, you know, the kind of good that that achieved, you know, for jazz at the same time as you know, this kind of like much grittier world downtown at the Knitting Factory and, you know, someone like Michael Dorff who started the place and the various musicians, you know, who played there, you know, what that energy was and finding the kind of commonalities, you know, between them. I mean, it's almost, 
I mean, I, I don't want to, you know, at this moment in our culture, it seems like the ability to do that is, is um, you know, often missing. Um, you know, so was that something that, you know, you had to really work through and make yourself do, or is that just the way you listen and how you approach things typically? I'm definitely a, um, a straddler in that sense. Um, and even at that time, you know, I, I arrived in New York in, right after, right after I was here, I went to New York and that was, so that was in, that was 20 years ago. Exactly. Um, <clears throat> and I was so intoxicated by the energy of, of the knitting factory and everything that was happening there. And, you know, Tonic opened about six weeks before I got to town. And, and I, it was one of the first gigs that I went to. I remember the house lights were on and they were serving vegan sandwiches and there was no li liquor license yet, you know? And I was like, this is the best thing ever, you know? Um, I felt very much a part of that creative community, but I also really loved... Um, I mean, I, I won't say that I loved Jazz and Lincoln Center as an institution, but I loved that they existed, and I, and I did have a deep personal history with Wynton Marsalis. Like, he was one of the first living jazz heroes that I had, because I, you know, I, did, I wasn't around in the 60s. You know, I, I came up, as a listener, I really came up in the 80s, you know, and so Wynton's heroic arrival is a part of my formative experience of this music. Um, and then subsequently, I had to kind of reconstruct the history that precedes him and the history that follows and, and not, you know, to me, it was always more sophisticated than the binary, you know. Um, and I actually, that's the chapter that I most doubted prior to putting it together. You know, I, I really thought, should this even be in here? I don't want to give it any credence as a, you know, as, as a, a polemic, right? So the idea of uptown and downtown, that rift always felt so stupid to me. Um, but it was an undeniable fact on the ground Absolutely. at that time. Yeah. And, and it wasn't just critics talking about it. And, you know, musicians really did, like, I don't want to say buy into, but musicians were speaking in those terms. Like, there really was a division. Um, you know, and you could call it uptown, downtown. You could call it inside, out, or whatever. Um, conservative progressive, you know, pick your, your terms. Um, <clears throat> and so I almost didn't want to, to revisit that argument because it felt like, thank God we're past it. Let's just let it lie. But I found myself repeatedly coming back to it and saying, well, this is a, a useful sort of dialectic here. Um, and if we've gotten past it, why have we? And what does that mean? And what does that tell us about... Um, like retroactively, what light does that shed on the the terms of that argument? You know, and so, in some ways, that I mean, that was definitely one of the more difficult chapters for me because I was so uncertain about um, whether I could sort of report on that history without getting like pulled back into it. Um, but I will say that I do believe that 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 argument is completely. Um, well, not completely, but I will say that the the prevalence of that set of of divisions um, has really softened and kind of evaporated. And and you know, I was just talking about um, trumpeter named Ambrose Akin Musseri, who has a, a new album coming out tomorrow that may well be my album of the year. Um, where do you put Ambrose Akin Musseri on the spectrum of inside outside? You know, he's he's on Blue Note Records. He's you know got total fluency in the post pop language. But he's writing for a string quartet and a rapper and electronics and you know and he plays um, atonal expressive uh, stuff in the context of this music. And it's like like where do you place him? Well, why do we have to place him anywhere? You know, so I, I think that that um, the permeability around that set of arguments is is one of the best things to happen uh, to this music in the last you know twenty years. I'd say. You know, one of the um uh, you know, one of the cases that you make in the book is that um, it, it's for the place of uh, writing and, uh, you know, criticism in particular uh, as part of the, the kind of jazz ecology, you know, and, you know, there's always this kind of sense of, you know, musicians complaining about critics, you know, and, and sometimes vice versa. Um, 
but you know, you make a case in the book, and you know, a bit when we were talking in class about, you know, the role that these voices have, that a critical voice has, and you know, the fact that like so many of you know, so many jazz players are also writers, and you know, sort of use that medium as a way to sort of advance their notion about you know what the music should be and where it should go and um you know so i wonder if you could you know we are at the kelly writer's house uh if you could talk a bit about the significance of of writing in that regard in the jazz world um so specifically artists like musicians who are who are writing uh and who are sort or of the place of uh, the place of writing even you know, I mean, including that, but you know, generally within um, you know the historical uh, landscape of what jazz is. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I, sometimes I wonder whether um, younger, wh whether people who are just coming to the music now have this experience. Uh, I need to talk to more uh, like twenty-year-old jazz listeners and t to get the answer to this. But you know, I began listening to the music uh, on CD. But there were still liner notes in those CDs, and I read them. Um, I read all of them, you know, because I was, at this time, I had no money, and, and I would get, it was actually a, uh, the Columbia House jazz program. Um, <laughs> those, those weren't yeah. necessarily my very first jazz albums, but, but pretty early on, my dad signed me up, and he was like, here, you know. And I think about that a lot, because... You know, we talk about canons. There's quite a bit in this book about, about the formation of canons and the sort of contestation of canons. Well, one of the first canons that I encountered was the Columbia House Jazz uh, subscription series. And when you, you know, it's interesting to me to think about what that meant for me as a young listener. It meant, among other things, that I received in the mail you know, one of my first five jazz albums was Louis Armstrong's Hot Fives and Sevens. Um, I also got... Dave Rubeck's Time Out and Ellington at Newport and Miles Davis's Kind of Blue and uh, Monk's Dream. Those were like my my jazz collection um, from the beginning was sort of that cornerstone material. And because only one of them came every month, I even if I didn't like it at first, you know, I lived with that album because I had no, you know, like I got the Hot Fives and Sevens and you know that that sounded pretty dated to my, you know, 14-year-old ears. Um, but I knew it was important because why else would it be in this, why else would it be in my mailbox, right? <laughs> and so I listened and listened and listened and, you know, after maybe two weeks, I loved it and, like, could hear it properly, you know? And I, and I was also reading the notes and then I went further and started reading stuff about it. And so my experience of the music historically, and part of this, too, is that there, there wasn't a thriving jazz scene in Honolulu, right? So I didn't have a whole lot of models for the music in real time. Um, so it really was a historical interface at first. Um, the, the literature around the music was certainly secondary to the music, but it was a part of the picture, you know? And I, and I feel like uh, <clears throat> I formed relationships with Nat Hantoff and Ira Gittler and Martin Williams um, at roughly the same time that I was forming relationships with Dizzy Gillespie and Thelonious Monk and, and Billie Holiday. Um, and so I am probably not like everybody in that respect, but I do think that um, criticism and scholarship and, and jazz you know, history, um, I mean, it's absolutely crucial, right? And so we talked a bit in class about how criticism now feels a little bit endangered. And I think, you know, musicians are beginning to wake up to the idea that like yeah you can badmouth jazz critics and every every working musician has been wronged unfairly by a critic you know um everyone uh but you can't just uh you can't remove that from the ecology and expect things to thrive you know it's it's the like a, a healthy art form requires a, a healthy and even disputatious criticism you know, one of the, uh, I mean, another point about the writing in the book, I think, is, um, you know, and it was apparent in the section that you read, is uh, I really liked the graceful way that you moved between your critical writing and, you know, uh, a series of profiles, you know, as these artists would, you know, step out onto the stage. Often they'd be mentioned a couple of times in other contexts because, you know, they all work together, but 
you know, uh, at the moment when you're really going to sink your teeth into, you know, what they're up to, often there's a scene like the one that you, you know, just described. And um, sort of both weaving in your kind of critical take on the work that, um, you know, that the artist is doing uh, at the same time as, you know, the, the kind of eye for those details that really... Um, make a scene vivid and make a, an artist come through in, in a, a very personal way, you know, is, is, is often difficult to balance. And people often are, you know, kind of draw a line between those two things. And I wonder if you could talk about that, you know, almost that kind of profile writing and, um, you know, critical writing and how you, uh, you know, how you saw them working together while you were doing this book. Yeah. Um that that's certainly a a big part of um the the struggle with the book was structure and figuring out how to sort of calibrate all those forces um i knew that i had core figures that meant a lot to me and that i that i see as really instrumental in the el evolution of the music you know in in this you know 20 year period um and so Pretty early on, I think from the from the book proposal stage, I knew that I wanted to intersperse sort of I, I would call them idea chapters with profile chapters. Um, initially, it was five and five, and then I, and then it turned into six and six. Um, and uh, at the very earliest stage, it was going to be five pianists, um, and I said, you know, the piano is is such a sort of it's an orchestrating instrument. It's an instrument that that tells you so much. And and I and I had five people that I wanted to to do. And then wisely, at, at a certain point, I said it would be like it'd be silly for me to just do pianists. You know, that would be really that would feel reductive. And so I I, I changed that around. Um, sorry, Craig Taborn, um, <laughs> <laughs> one of my favorite musicians on the planet, and he didn't get a profile because I had already done Vijay and Brad. Uh, and uh, Steve Coleman, and so th it was important to me too that the that the profile that each profile have a sort of make a different point or set of points, right? So, so Brad Meldow is the first profile chapter, and to me that chapter is about Brad, but it's also about sort of the anxiety of influence and the transition from a sort of neoconservative viewpoint to a kind of forward thinking and and amalgamating and hybridist viewpoint. And so Brad, to me, is this transitional figure. Um, and so that's what that chapter is about. And, you know, as much as it's about him as a person and as an artist, it's about that. Um, you know, the Esperanza Spalding chapter is, is sort of about jazz in the spotlight. You know, um, John Batiste also appears in that chapter. Um, Christian Scott Atunde Adjua appears in that chapter. Um, you know, I could have put some other people in there, but I really... I wanted it to still be sort of Esperanza in the spotlight, you know, and she certainly deserves it. Um, so, um, and then the other thing uh, in response to your question is that um, it was really important to me and it was really important to my editor um, <clears throat> that we accomplish some kind of narrative momentum with the book. And he was uh, mostly very encouraging um, of the copy that I filed. And the only time he ever gave me notes was when he felt like something was getting a little bogged down. Um, and that happened a little bit with, like, some of early Wynton Marsalis, and you sure. know, he felt like, like, let's, we don't have to do all of this here. You can, you know, maybe take out a section, and it'll still, you'll still get the picture, you know. Um, but the idea that you can actually sit down and read this book, you know, very which true. a lot of a lot of jazz books, and certainly some very important jazz books, are not really books that you read from cover to cover necessarily, um, and. They're more sort of a reference, or you know, or it's a collection of essays that are not necessarily tied by a larger construct. Um, <clears throat> and so, one of the things I love hearing the most, and you know, it's only been out for a short while, but I've heard from a few people who've said like, "Oh, I, you know, I s like I just blew through it this weekend," you know, and that makes me exactly. so happy. That's right? exactly right. Yeah. It's it's just like so satisfying to feel like it um, reads well. It reads very well. You know, it. Um, you know, as I mentioned, you know, I mean, I'm not. You know, I'm kind of conversant, but I'm not a jazz expert by any means. But, you know, just, you know, both, so many of the ideas that you bring up are, are applicable in many ways. Uh, and also just the sent sentence to sentence 
it was a pleasure to read. You know, and so you never kind of felt like, man, I'm just you know, having a slog through this. It was, <laughs> it was really, really, um, you know, quite a feat, uh, you know, again, at, at that length. Thank you. Um, and I think part of the reason that you can actually, that it, that it does pull you through is because that there are characters, you know? Yes. Be because the, cause the profile, um, early in the going, like I think the, with the first batch of copy that I filed, my editor said, you know, when, when you latch onto a profile, there's a sense of, of exhaling. Like, you know, it just feels like it's smooth and sort of comforting. Um, and I think that's a format that we all understand. You know, we all read like profiles in, you know, in magazines and in arts and leisure and wherever, you know, just the artist profile is a real sort of, it's a format that we're all familiar with. Um, whereas a chapter on like the rise of institutionalized jazz education, <laughs> you know, uh, you, you've got to give people like a spoonful of sugar <laughs> to, uh, to motivate them. Although that was pretty fascinating. I mean, like maybe as an educator, I, I was particularly struck by it, but you know, that aspect of what, you know, what that development and, you know, just the camps and the schools and right. all of the ways in which those things work together, um, you know, you just kind of wove that, you know, you, you pull them together in a very effective way that, that, that made it clear that how in, you know, five years or 10 years or 20 years, certainly, uh, the impact that that was going to have on the people that, who emerged out of, you know, those environments. Right. Um, oh, can, you know, you just made me think of something, too, that um, well, as we talk about the, the puzzling together yeah. of things, um, here's an example. Uh, Danilo Perez is a Panamanian pianist who, who appears in the book in a chapter titled The New Elders. Um, and he's the you know, it's a sort of a vignette at the opening of that chapter talking about him joining the Wayne Shorter Quartet. Um, and so that's a story that I, that I liked. And I, and, but before I settled on that, I was certain that Danilo Perez was going to be a key figure in another chapter, which is basically about jazz internationalism and sort of the polyglot nature of, you know, the music uh, acquiring all these, like, folkloric elements from other cultures sure. because his album Motherland was so important in that. And, and so I was like, oh, Danilo's going to be in that chapter. Um, but he also just could have easily have been a major figure in the jazz education chapter. You know, it's like there are a yes. bunch of musicians like this where well, where do you place him or her when there's so many different things that they touch, you know, and ultimately, um, I don't know if it was the right decision, but Danilo just that story just brought us into the jazz elders chapter in a way that felt um, it had a little bit of narrative tension, um, as opposed to just saying, well, here's an important album that this guy made, you know? Yeah. Well, you know, there's also, I mean, when talking about some of the stories that you tell, um, you know, and, that, and their applicability in other areas. I mean, I love, the, like, some of the Steve Coleman stuff with, you know, Play the Mountain. And he goes, yeah, you know, and then, you know, people will say to me, oh, you mean, like, you're inspired by the mountain? He goes, no, I want to play the mountain and it's almost like getting this kind of riddle yeah you know that you know that you begin to ponder and then you wonder yeah well how does that you know how does that apply to me as a writer or how does that you know you can use these things or you know the part where you know miles davis somebody's quoting him and, and says you know if anybody said anything philosophical around miles he would say play that you know and that just take your idea and play that yeah i mean that is you know i think that's just kind of excellent advice for anybody doing any kind of creative work, um, you know, so that, 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 you know, the impact of, you know, some of these, you know, uh, stories that you're telling, I think, extend, you know, well beyond even, you know, the significance of the jazz world. Jazz musicians have their sort of philosophical game intact. Like, they, they sort of know, they know this stuff because they talk about it all the time, you know, and, and so... Um, anytime uh, something like that comes in, it's because I've, I've been lucky enough to be privy to something, you know, and it sticks with me. Like, you know, there's, I think Steve Coleman is, might be the oldest interview source in the book. Um, there's a conversation from 1996 that's, that's in the book. Um, and I think that's probably the oldest 
uh, interview in the index or in the in the notes. Um, but yeah, Steve is one of those artists who has a way of saying something that then rattles around in your head for a while. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> well, um, let's see where we are. Let's uh, open the floor to questions, comments. Yes. I had someone's about to hand you a microphone, I think. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, Pass the mic. <laughs> <laughs> so there, I was, I was, I haven't finished it yet, but I was reading last night, and there was something that that kind of made me stop in my tracks a little bit. I think it was in the, I think it was in the the chapter about uptown downtown, and um, it was about how young musicians, in some sense. Um, kind of liked the this kind of broad distinction because it helped them get gigs. And um, it really kind of hit me, and uh, this kind of ties in, I think, to what you were saying about the relationship between the discourse and the music and et cetera. But it, it kind of reminded me, like being in grad school, I remember it, there was a lot of, you know, people were doing a lot of different kinds of projects, but um, at some point, somebody on the faculty would always say, well, you have to market yourself. You have to, you, you know, you have to, f to make yourself fit. Are, are you going to go for a post-colonial job? Are you going to go for an early 19th century? I mean, so that there, you know, these things happen, but then I, I think about the field and then think about the fact that, well, no, sure, at some point, nobody knew what post-colonial studies was, right? But then all of a sudden, it got a nice name. And, you know, then, um, uh, you know, there were positions that were opened in that, that kind of thing. So I'm thinking about the sort of progress of, if you if you think of it progressively, um, but you think about the kind of opening up in experimentation that that jazz seems seems so inherent in the art form, mm -hmm. and how that there's a kind of a dialectic between that and the writing, so that you know it's it's a it's a constant it's a constant challenge it seems to me to to try to tell people what it is that they might be hearing yeah. with you know as you know, working working with a presenter, you know, how do you how do you how do you get people interested in in and and give them some idea of what it is, but don't you know, not in a reductionist way. So I guess I'm just interested if you could sort of talk about that kind of, is it a progressive dialectic? Is it something that's really peculiar? It seems to me that it's peculiar to jazz in a certain kind of way, and I would just be interested in hearing you say something about that. Well, there's so much, so much to impact there. Um, you haven't gotten to it yet in the book, but um, <laughs> but at, at, but in the in the afterward, I think um, uh, there's a line that still troubles me a little bit. But it's basically, it's to, the line is something like, um, "To be a successful jazz artist today is, on some level, to be a conceptualist." Um, and I think some of that has to do with the the infrastructure for, like the support system for this music is now so tied to a certain kind of institutional um, approval. So, um, you know, the, the I didn't thank them in the acknowledgments, but maybe I should have th thanked the, the MacArthur Foundation um, for, you know, for giving genius grants to so many jazz musicians, you know, uh, many of whom appear in this book, you know, and, and so, so that's interesting to think about, you know, these, these artists are not getting genius grants because they're just really great improvisers, you know, there's, there's a, there's a, a kind of synthesis and a kind of, um, you talk about, you know, artists being able to right. write, um, there is a, there's a sort of baseline, I won't say requirement, but there's a strong pressure to be someone who can think about, you know, uh, interdisciplinary engagement and sort of um, historical echoes. And, you know, uh, Jason Moran is probably the most vivid example of this, you know, someone who is just always creating and thinking and engaging with artists from other disciplines. And um, Steve Coleman's another good example, although in a very different way. Um, I feel like that has always been a part of the jazz tradition. Certainly, you can talk about Duke Ellington um, being that kind of artist as well. But we now have um, we now have a sort of uh, formalized reward system for that kind of conceptual thought, and and I think that jazz musicians have uh, 
they already have such flexibility of expression uh, as composers and improvisers that um, they're really well positioned to, to take advantage of that. Um, but one thing that is interesting, my, so my friend Evan Hager, who used to be my editor at Jazz Times, he asked me a question um, in maybe my first interview around like press for the book. Um, he asked me a great question, which was like, okay, 10 years from now, let's say you're putting out an anniversary edition of the book, like what's, what's in your afterward? Like what's, what do you think you're gonna be talking about as having happened in the next decade? Um, and uh, one of the things I mentioned was this, like what's really still kind of a burgeoning um, like love affair between the jazz avant-garde and classical new music establishment. Um, and I, I saw this at the Ojai Music Festival last year, which is a scene that opens my Vijay Iyer chapter. Um, Taishan Sori has an album coming out tomorrow that is um, like almost four hours long and um, like definitely not something you're gonna hear on WBGO, um, although it will be on WBGO.org. <laughs> um, so there's something happening there that is, you know, and I think um, Professor George Lewis has been like, you know, th this book that he put out a decade ago was really sort of paradigmatic in terms of like, like, oh, we can understand uh, like what the terms of this whole like uh, system of creative thinking, you know, it, it was, it's such a monumental book and it really helped a lot of people to understand what this, you know, movement, movement, you know, set of systems, whatever you want to call it, um, that the AACM represents. Um, but we're sort of in a post-AACM reality now, um, which is really interesting. Anyone? Yes, sir. Um, I have not yet uh, had the satisfaction of reading your book, and I probably come from this um, among the least knowledgeable about jazz. Uh, I'm, I, your title is Playing Changes, Jazz for the New Century. I read a little bit of the introduction and then later. Um, uh, are you able to sort of be now at a pretty high altitude in a summary form? And is there a direction that you would say jazz has moved in in the last call it 30, 40 years, I picked those, but over a long period. And then is there a, an arc to, and a momentum to where that is headed? And if the answer is yes, uh, what do you, what explains the changes? I sort of think of an evolutionary kind right. of, like you can borrow sort of a history of ideas from social sciences and think about um, evolutionary theory to explaining it, is that, I think evolutionary theory is useful, but linear progress is not for me. Um, and, and I spend a, a fair amount of time in the book kind of attempting to push back against and dismantle this really powerful, uh, you know, natural human tendency to draw a line um, in terms of a historical lineage and also in terms of an evolution of style. I, I don't know that that's so useful. Uh, I feel like when we talk about how things have changed, to me, it's, it's helpful not to think of it in terms of progress so much as kind of shifting conditions. And so a lot of that, a lot of what has changed really definitively, I think, uh, in the last, let's say, 30 years, is the permeability around the terms of the art. Um, and so, um, you know, th there was a really, really persuasive and dominant um, paradigm during the, the 80s and 90s of, you know, a kind of um, essentialism and uh, like th this is what jazz is, you know, it's a push towards definition and um, I'm not 100% opposed to that and I've, I've had some interesting conversations with musicians since the book came out um, who have kind of said like definitions are helpful, you know, like it's it's good that we not lose sight of like what's at you know what the what the sort of essence of this music is. At the same time, um, I think it's been really to the benefit of the art form that we've been l less interested in policing its borders. Um, 
that there's there's more room and more kind of encouragement for artists who are really interested in hybridizing and and um, converging and um, doing those sorts of of things that apply the jazz tradition not so much as a fixed uh, language or or um, or like a literature, but more as a process, you know, um, like the jazz tradition as a as a means of engaging. Um, that's really interesting to me, and that's kind of a, a that's like I said just now. It's sort of a post AACM way of thinking about things. Um, but yeah, I guess that's my answer. It's it's that. Um, I'm not into drawing the straight line. I'm into kind of trying to see the picture. Sir? Um, we've been talking at a very high conceptual level, and I have a very mundane <laughs> question to ask. Uh, and it's about you, what is could you talk some about writing, uh, writing about music? That is to say, using words to describe sound. So when you go to a jazz concert and you're trying to write a piece about it to describe what you heard there, is that difficult? Is that easy for you? I mean, I can, uh, to me it would seem difficult. That's hence my question, I guess. No, thank you. That, that's. A very good question. Yeah, that's a, especially the, the at the very writer's basic house. question. Exactly. Um, so, it is not easy, um, but it it gets easier with practice. And I, you know, that that's sort of the first the first thing you have to grapple with if you're writing about a music like jazz. You know, if if I were writing about indie rock, I, I would have lyrics to write about more often. Um, so, so describing sound is kind of like your first. The first hurdle you have to clear, um, and uh, I was really fortunate in that um, I was here at Penn as a creative writing major um, with a poetry emphasis. Um, so I basically, like, in, within my major, I was I was studying and reading and writing poetry, um, and that's you know my my experience here at the Writers House was very tied into that. Um, you know, it was a, it was a Nirvana. Um, I was, as assistant coordinator, I was the one who picked up the poet at, at 30th Street Station and, and took her to lunch and then came and, you know, made sure that everything was okay with the, the books and whatever. Um, so I had this amazing engagement with people who worked with language, you know, in, in you know, purely creative fashion. So when I be began to think of myself as a critic, um, most of my writing experience had been, um, you know, not journalistic. It had been like poetry. Um, and so that certainly was helpful to me to, to just have a certain um, experience with that, you know. Um, and then and then it's just, beyond that, it's just grinding it out, <laughs> you know. And it, it, especially for me, um, writing, working at the Times for, for a dozen years, most of that time I was churning out, you know, two or three live reviews a week. Um, and, you know, what that entailed was, you know, I'd go to the, go to the gig and I'd, you know, go home. I, I learned pretty early on that it was not helpful to me to then go home and immediately start writing. Um, so I would go to sleep and I would, and I had a noon deadline. And I also learned that if I woke up at seven or six to start to meet my noon deadline, the work wasn't going to be any better than if I woke up at nine. So, so I said, all right, well, so here's, I have, it's almost like turning the hourglass over and it's like, you just got to do it. And so, um, so that was also like really helpful um, because you don't have time to really um, fool around with it too much. Well, there's, um, you know, in terms of the writing in, in um, Nate's book, one of the things that struck me, I mean, and it sounds like such a pedestrian idea, but like vocabulary is really important. Like, you know, if you're, you know, just just about every jazz artist, you know, that we can all mention is at least mentioned in this book. And 
you know, Nate is consciously trying to cover a lot of ground. And if you're doing that, you know, you need to make like fine distinctions about the sounds they're making, the music they're creating, you know, without being, you know, without being too prissy about it either. And, you know, Nate does a really nice job of that. And I think so many times it's just the, the freshness of his language. Like if, you know, if you've got 10 words that you're trying to choose from to describe what a specific effect is, that's better than if you have one or two, you know, and, and he's able to, um, to do that. So it's the, the skill as a writer um, is, is, I think, key to this. I mean, his knowledge is impeccable. So that, you know, I mean, that kind of goes without saying, or it's worth saying anyway, but, uh, you know, the, the, the ability to kind of get it down in this very, very precise way is one of the real joys. I mean, I found just as someone who writes about music myself that it was, uh, you know, I got an idea or two I want to take. <laughs> Anthony's check is in the mail. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. uh, yes. Um, this is also 20 years ago. I came to Penn to uh, a concert at Irvine Auditorium with uh, Herbie Hancock and Wayne Shorter. It was the time of their One Plus One album. And maybe you were there for that. It was that time period anyway you were there <laughs> you know i, I don't i don't think i was there oh. that was i think at that point i had already moved to new york okay anyway i saw them at carnegie yeah so i saw them at irvine and there was an intermission and so i go down to the men's room uh and there are two guys ahead of me and we're all sort of unloading in there and and one says to the other one well, I don't know what that was, but it sure wasn't jazz. And um, I have read your book, and I agree, it is beautifully, so beautifully written. Thank but you. I took it as a personal reproach uh, for how ignorant I am. Uh, not only ignorant, but... Um, in, in, indifferent and incurious in the sense of I know there's a lot of music out there that doesn't swing and I've heard uh, some of the uh, artists that you refer to in your book I've attended their work and they don't swing and so 20 years later I'm like those two old guys <laughs> uh, 20 years ago, and I'm saying, well, I, you know, I, I don't know what it is, but it sure ain't jazz. <laughs> I wonder, I don't think swing appears in your book, uh, uh, it's certainly not a, a, a passionate description no, that or very embrace point, of it. No, the very point about the, what is it, the house of swing, I mean, comes up in the... Yeah, I mean, well, I, I, I do write that, about swing, yeah. uh, uh, but I, I'm glad that you I'm glad that you're here because I did write this book as a repro reproach of you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, I, I um, you are right in noticing that that there is a lot of you know music in the the present moment that is not primarily obsessed with swinging, and but I I would also counter that, um, and I didn't devote a specific section to this, but, but it comes up a lot, like just here and there. Um, the, the parameters of swing, I would counter, have, have actually changed. Um, I think that this was already happening in the 90s with someone like Brad Meldow, um, with you know, what he was doing with Jorge Rossi on drums. There is a, a certain rhythmic feeling that that trio um, put together that was, and I write about this in the Brad chapter, um, it was a straight eighth note that swung. It was this kind of like interesting, like uh, in between feeling that um, it had a sense of like breath and pulse. Um, it didn't swing in the way that we think of, you know, like the, the sort of classic Joe Jones swing, pa swing ride cymbal swing pattern, right? Um, or even later, Elvin Jones, you know? Um, 
or Philly Joe Jones. No Joneses involved. Um, but Just but they're, keep it up with the Joneses. But you know. Yeah. But if you think about swing as a feeling rather than a f like a pattern, if you think of it as this kind of like um, you know certain kind of bounce and pliability and you know then um, I, you know I would argue that the Brad Meldau trio does swing. Now, are they swinging? I don't. <laughs> that's different. Um, but I, I do think that uh, the terms of of like you know. I would be more concerned about sort of the obsolescence of swing if I didn't have so much vital evidence that it is alive and well, you know, and, and you look at, you look at someone like Christian Sands, you know, who's able to, to shift and, and really go either, either way, you know, um, there's a lot of young musicians who come up with like a deep, deep awareness and understanding of how swing is supposed to feel, but, but it's not, I think you're right in, in, suggesting that it is not at the center of the conversation at the moment. Can we have one more? One more question? Um, well, excuse let's, me. Let's uh, to, um, uh, how y'all doing? Uh, oh, hey. My name is uh, Marlo Crawford. I'm, a, um, you know, I'm an independent artist. I'm 47, but I've been doing music since I was 14. You know, when I was younger, you know, I missed out like two record deals, but you know. But uh, as I got further in my career, I met Dr. Maurice Henderson here, which, which took me on tour halfway across the world, you know, and was trying to show me about the music business. But jazz is, um, um, even though I'm a hip hop artist, I listen to jazz. I put jazz on and write my songs. You know, like it helped me think, it helps me think. But I like jazz music, but I just want to commend you because it's a lot of starving artists out here, a lot of musicians that get into the game that fell. You know, some of them try to make it. Everybody can't make it big. It's hard. The 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 um the music business is hard. Period. And I just want to commend you. You know, keep up the good work because it's a blessing. Dudes like you or Dr. Henderson, you know, you, you want to share what you know. You know what I mean? You know, and it's a hard thing to grasp, man. You know, hands on. You know, it's 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 a rough road, man. You know, so I want you, you know, keep the good work. And I want to ask you, do you plan on putting out a part two to the book? Well, thank you, Marlo, for your commendation. That, that actually it really means a lot. Um, and and you're right that it's people are. It is a struggle. <laughs> you know, it's a struggle for musicians as it's a struggle for for a lot of writers. Um, I would love to write a, a sort of part two to the book, um, but I feel like I need some time to synthesize what's happening. You know, um, it's funny. My, it's so um, I'm so accustomed to like turning around stuff quickly and then seeing it in print and then moving on to the next thing. And so this book has been an interesting experience because once it was done, it's, it's done. You can't tinker with it anymore, you know? And, and there's stuff that's come out in the last, you know, two months that I'm like, oh man, how could I not get that in there, you know? So I'm, I'm definitely still very much like ear to the ground and trying to, to pay attention and, you know, w we'll see what happens. I, I, would, I would love to, you know, uh, continue to bear witness, um, but yeah. Did, you wanted one more question. Oh yeah. So um, John Swed had a, a question, and we'll and we'll close with that. And before we before we go to Professor Swed, I just want to note there are books for sale, um, and there it's a good price. Uh, and I will I will sign those or any other copies you have um, happily, and I'll talk in the in the uh, dining room. Um, so, again, thank you. Thanks to everyone for being here. Professor Swed. So, several things you said about jackets and notes and so on sent me thinking about something else, which is there were those, those albums that had no notes on them. And, and by the way, the interaction between the notes and the, and the illustrations or the paintings that were on the front were kind of important. They were often, they were often inappropriate and it would set up some kind of dissonance. But anyway. Um, Things like ESP and, and Saturn's, um, you know, you're on your own with those things. And the shock to your system when you got that stuff home, you know. And I, I used to ask people who were frankly freaks, like um, LaDonna Smith and Davy Williams, who were raised in Tus Tuscaloosa. Actually, D Davy Smith was raised, uh, Davy Williams was raised in the same town I was in, which is Utah, Alabama, which is like, a, you know, what did, what did Trump call them? Shitholes? Yeah, the shit, <laughs> nah. a genuine shithole. Uh, how could you hear this stuff? How could you think you're going to play a guitar with a glove with little fans on, on each finger and so forth? 
He said, we went into, um, <laughs> both of them went into, um, I don't know, a Rexall drugstore in, um, in Tuscaloosa, and there were these weird looking records. And one said, you never heard such sounds in your life, and the other guy was like, they go and have no idea what they are. So one thing we've lost with these instant, everyone's a critic, is, um, well, it's not that everything is up on the web, that's delusional, but the shock of the system that could come from picking up something you had no context for, you weren't sure it was music, and yet it was coming in this, this form. You know what I'm getting at here? Uh, where you, you had no guidance, you couldn't go to a critic, you couldn't go to Martin Williams, you couldn't go to, you know, they, they, they were closet, what, what, closet high modernist, you know? I mean, um, right. You know. Well, so it's funny. One of the things that the experience you're describing makes me think of, actually, is Kamasi Washington, believe it or not, because he's appearing at these big pop festivals. Um, his band is playing Coachella. They're playing Bonnaroo. They're playing, you know, they're playing to 40,000, 70,000 people. And there is no context. You know, the, like the, the, the kids, you know, and they're not all kids, but the, the kids who are at the festival um, are there for an experience. And, you know, maybe they know his music, but some of them certainly did not. And then here comes this band with this absolutely visceral, explosive force. And, you know, I think you know, jazz critics who have a, uh, or listeners who have a framework to, to put that music in are not so impressed by it. But um, for someone who's never been nailed to the wall by the sound of a tenor saxophone, like just blasting, um, it's an extremely powerful moment. And, and so um, this is one thing, um, and I think it, you know, my experience with the avant-garde in jazz um, like I had listened to some stuff, but really until I was in Philadelphia as a college student and I got to experience sort of the, the spirit move in the room, um, I, I was not really, um, like I didn't really understand how to get in, you know? And so, um, so this is actually, this goes to, like you, you, you were talking about sort of, of albums and context of albums, but to me, like I've had people ask me recently, like, okay, you know, if, if I'm just getting into jazz or if someone, if I know someone who is, who doesn't know where to begin, like what album would you recommend or where, you know, where would you start? And my sort of, it's, it's partly a dodge, but it's also partly like my true feelings. I say like, what's important is you should go hear live music. You should, you know, whatever town you're in, find out where there are improvisers playing and go. You know, and, and if you're lucky, it'll be really good. And even if you're not lucky, you'll understand something about the music, you know. You'll like to be in a, in a physical space and to hear, you know, to, uh, to see it unfolding in a present tense and to hear it and to feel it in your body. Like, and there's no, not, not necessarily a context for that, you know. Um, and that's sort of my, that's now my advice. I'm just like, go, just go hear live music and it will... S something will be revealed to you, even if it's not, even if you don't love it, something will be revealed to you. Well, thank you all for coming. Please join us. Uh, thanks to thank Nate, you. of course. Um, Nate, as you mentioned, we'd be happy to continue the conversation. Uh, would be even happier if you bought a book and Adam sign it. And, uh, you know, have a bite, have a drink, and uh, stick around for a bit. Uh, thank you all, and Nate, thanks so much, man. You were great. Thank you, Anthony. Yeah, pleasure. <laughs>